What is up, you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. Don't worry, I'm changing this after today's video. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case while I put on some makeup. So if that sounds like something that you might enjoy, I'd say subscribe because then you too can kick off your weeks with a terrible story and mediocre makeup. That said though, if you're not into the true crime and makeup thing, I get it. So just for you, I actually have some links down in the description box that can help to guide you within your own research into this case if you so choose. Well, hopefully I put them down there because I'm not gonna lie, half the time I do forget. So your guess is as good as mine as if I remembered to put them down there this week or not. Fingers crossed. And with all of that said and done, let's go ahead and get into today's case. So, how's everybody doing? Everybody, everybody good? Well, I hope you enjoyed it while it lasted because I'm about to yank your warm fuzzies right away from you. And I ain't replacing it with anything good. Sorry. Now, I know I haven't really been doing content warnings at the beginning of my videos anymore, which honestly, I'm really not even sure why I stopped doing that, but regardless, if ever there was a time to heed a content warning slash if ever there was a case that needed a content warning, it's today. Today's case is hands down, without a doubt, one of the worst cases I have ever researched. It is so brutal and oh, dude, it is just, it's all bad. It's so, so, so bad. It's gonna stick with you and it's going to upset you. Just for a little context, um, inherently, just by doing what I do here, I have relatively thick skin when it comes to researching these cases, but this one, this one in particular, I'm telling you, it really fucked with my head. So proceed with caution because once you've heard it, you can't unhear it, okay? Today, we're going to be discussing the horrifying and disturbing kidnapping, rape, torture, and murder of 16-year-old Darlene Prioriello. This case was another request, so if everyone could please join me in thanking Inlay for requesting this one. Thank you, Inlay, but also, how dare you? No, I'm totally kidding. She was actually incredibly kind and transparent with me from the get-go in her request form. She made sure to adequately warn me about what I was getting into before I even started researching. She even warned me that I would likely cry looking into Darlene's story and full transparency, she was not wrong. There were more than a few times during researching this one that I found myself either tearing up or needing to just shut my laptop and step away for a while. So yeah, strap on in because here we go. All right, so for today's story, we're once again going to need our long undies and we're probably gonna need some hot hands because this one's got us going up north. Well, it's north for me. I guess I don't really know where it's got each of you heading respectively, so Canada. We're in Canada today. Ah, Canada, the great white north. America's hat, if you will. You think they hate that one? I bet it's not their favorite. Today, we're in Mississauga, which is a city in Ontario that I had to write out embarrassingly phonetically in my notes to make sure that I didn't make a fool out of myself trying to stutter it out here with you now. A little BTS knowledge for you there. Mississauga, Mississauga, Mississauga. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Anyways, Mississauga, nicknamed a cultural canvas, is a city in Ontario that neighbors Toronto. It sits on the western shore of Lake Ontario. It's almost a 115 square mile plot of land, and it hosts a population of over 700 thousand people. That's the population as of 2021, though. Back in the 80s, when our story takes place, the population was actually less than half of what it is now. Back then, it was closer to like 300,000 people. But with the population encroaching a million or not, Mississauga definitely still sounds like it would be a fun place to live or to grow up, or at the very least, it sounds like a fun place to visit, especially if you enjoy the great outdoors. It's located on the water. It has a ton of different like biking areas areas and hiking trails. It's just a short day trip from Niagara Falls and even from the US border. On top of that, there's a lot of shopping malls. There's like a huge ice skating rink in the Celebration Square in the winter. And then throughout the rest of the year, the Celebration Square holds a myriad of multicultural festivals. Like honestly, Mississauga, 
sounds poppin' nowadays, at least. But I would have to assume that back in the 60s, when Darlene Prioriello was born, things were probably a lot quieter and a lot calmer. Darlene Nikki Prioriello, most commonly referred to as Dolly by those who knew her, was born on July 2nd, 1965 in Mississauga to her parents Nick and Helen. Darlene was the second youngest of Nick and Helen's four children. She had an older sister named Terry and then the two girls had two brothers named Nick and Anthony. So definitely a full house at the Prioriellos. And although Nick and Helen did ultimately end up divorcing, the four children still remained incredibly close and the family overall remained pretty tight-knit. The children were happy, they were well-adjusted, and Darlene in particular, well, in a lot of ways, she was just your average, typical, run-of-the-mill teenage girl. She loved horses, she loved music, she loved fashion, she loved hanging out with her friends. Like I said, a lot of things about her were pretty typical. But then, in some ways, Darlene was extraordinary for a teenage girl. For starters, she was a straight-A student, and on top of that, she was also a highly sought after and highly respected babysitter in her community. But despite all the things about Darlene that were like more traditionally feminine, she still often got referred to as a tomboy given her desire to someday become an electrician. Actually, she was the only girl in her high school's electronics class, but Darlene could not have been less bothered by this. She didn't care if it was conventional. She didn't care if it was traditional, like she she just didn't care. She told her mom that it did not matter to her what other people said or what other people thought about what she wanted to do with her life. Becoming an electrician was something that she was incredibly passionate about and come hell or high water, she was going to do it. And personally, I think that that is just so incredibly admirable of her because as a previous teenage girl, I can tell you firsthand how hard it is to step outside of what's considered cool or what's considered like normal. So props to her for always being authentically who she was and for always being like true to herself. Cause it took me well into my probably late twenties to carry myself with that kind of confidence. So to do so at 16, I mean, that's incredible. Plus ain't nothing wrong with a steam girly. Steam, stem, I swear I've seen it both ways. Either way, we could probably use more steam girlies. And while yes, that's a completely different discussion for a different day, I definitely do think that Darlene could have been a trailblazer. Ooh, she also played these steel drums in her school's band, which is definitely not something you hear every day. I even read from one source that she was hoping to go with her school's band on a trip to Jamaica soon. So clearly when Dolly found something that she was interested in, she put 100% of herself into it. And while all of that stuff is definitely cool, the steel drums, the straight A's, the horses, the electrical classes, all the stuff that we just went over, far and away what stuck out to me the most when it came to who Darlene was were the stories of how thoughtful and how kind that she always was to those around her. And I'm not just referencing the stereotypical, like, oh, she was nice to everyone she met, like type of nice, although I'm sure that she was. But I'm talking about the instances where Darlene took her kindness far beyond what you'd expect out of a typical high school girl or high schooler in general. Not only did she once save up her hard earned allowance in order to buy a classmate of hers some nicer clothes, but Darlene would also frequently invite over her classmates if she ever got the feeling that one of them might be going through a hard time. Whether it was to offer them a home cooked meal or just some companionship or whether she just felt like they needed some TLC, Darlene was always the first and sometimes the only person to reach out to some of her struggling or less fortunate classmates. And at the risk of repeating myself, I have to say that that is an incredibly admirable trait for such a young person. Like, sure, I pride myself on being a good person now, but in high school compared to Darlene, I was basically a skid mark on the underpants of society. This girl was like an angel among us. But unfortunately, the world would be robbed of Darlene and her generosity and her kindness far, far too early. And poor Darlene, she would be robbed at the chance of having any sort of real future. She would never get to grow up to become an electrician. She'd never get to fall in love or to get married or 
to have children, just none of it. She would never get the chance to do all of the things that a lot of us take for granted, all because some sick, selfish, depraved, disgusting monster happened to cross paths with her one night in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that, my friends, regretfully, brings us to the horrific events of May 6th, 1982. Now, that evening did not start off horrific, not by any stretch. Darlene spent the evening at her boyfriend's house. They hung out, they watched a movie. It was a school night, so Darlene had committed to an 11 o'clock curfew, but beyond that, it was just a normal, average, run-of-the-mill Thursday night. The movie ended, and while she probably was going to be cutting it close to her curfew, if she caught the next bus and she went straight home, she would have probably gotten there pretty much right on time. So she and her boyfriend set off. He accompanied her out of the house, and he walked her to the nearest bus stop. It was located at North Service and Cawthra Roads, and when I say this bus stop was nearby, I mean it was very close to Darlene's boyfriend's house. So close, in fact, that he could very clearly see it from his bedroom window. So obviously this wasn't a very long walk for the two of them. And once they got to the bus stop, her boyfriend stood and he waited with her. They chit-chatted about the movie they just watched. They stood there and they stood there and they stood there until they finally realized that of course, as luck would have it, the bus looked as though it was running behind schedule. And so being the selfless person that Darlene was and not wanting to put her boyfriend out, Darlene eventually told him that the bus would probably be there any minute and that he really didn't have to keep waiting with her if he didn't want to. He could just go on and head home. And I mean, realistically, what reason would she have to believe that she would be anything other than safe? waiting there for the bus for a couple of minutes within like spitting distance of her boyfriend's house. She had probably waited at that very bus stop plenty of times before, but even so, her boyfriend really was uncomfortable with this. My guess is because it was so late and he did voice these concerns to Darlene, but in the end, she insisted that he go. She told him that she didn't want to inconvenience him and that she didn't want to cause him any trouble. Like she just didn't feel like it was necessary for him to keep waiting there with her. And so very, very reluctantly, her boyfriend did eventually slowly start to make his way back to his house. But because he had been so apprehensive to leave her, he did take his sweet time walking the short distance home just to make sure that he could continuously look over her shoulder like every couple of seconds to check on Darlene and to make sure that she was still okay. And sure enough, just as you'd expect, every time he turned around, everything was fine. Darlene was still there. She was still in the exact same spot he'd left her in. And she was still simply, innocently, and safely waiting for the bus. She was there right up until he walked into his front door through his house and into his room. However, within that tiny, tiny window of what, 60, maybe 90 seconds, that was when Darlene did actually happen to disappear from the bus stop before he could check on her again. But given that it was already a few minutes past when the bus had been scheduled to arrive in the first place, he didn't really think anything of the fact that she was gone. He just assumed that the bus had arrived, Darlene had boarded it, and now she was safely on her way home. He could have never imagined that instead of waiting there patiently for the bus to arrive, like he was under the impression that she would, Darlene had instead accepted a ride home from a total stranger. She had been offered this ride from a boy who, unbeknownst to her, was sick, twisted, and disturbed beyond anyone's plausible comprehension. And what is so, so incredibly sad about this is that Darlene only accepted this ride because she was worried about missing her curfew. Sure, she didn't want to get in trouble, but I'd be willing to bet that more than anything, she probably didn't want to worry her mom. And so because this bus was apparently super behind schedule, Darlene took the ride, thinking that this was the fastest option available to her. But devastatingly, this boy had absolutely no intention of seeing to it that Darlene would get home safely. David James Dobson was a 17-year-old high school dropout loser who unfortunately lived just a few minutes away from Darlene with his parents. And just to clarify, I'm not saying he was a loser because he dropped out of high school or rather was kicked out. He was expelled shortly before our story because of his incessant fighting, but 
Even so, not finishing high school does not necessarily make you a loser. Actually, I think it's rather elitist to judge someone solely based on the education opportunities that were available to them, but I digress. I'm calling David a loser for no other reason than the fact that he is a loser through and through, educated or not. His background could be that he graduated first in his class from Harvard Medical School, and I would still think that he was a loser because of how he goes on to behave and what he goes on to do. Speaking of David's background though, there actually really isn't too much like on official record to help us understand who David is or how he was brought up. But what is available out there though, and plentifully might I add, is rumors. Rumors about his upbringing, rumors about his own weird actions. Just lots and lots of stories about who he might have been. And I'll tell you what, ain't none of it great. From incest to fighting to torturing animals to once pleasuring himself in front of some of his classmates with his own mother's battery-powered self-love apparatus. If even half of the rumors that I've seen circulate around about him are true. And there wasn't a single person out there that was like, eh, we should probably keep an eye on this kid. Yikes. And honestly, that's probably really not even capturing how big of a ball drop this really was. If these stories are true, it should have been very obvious from pretty early on that he was sexually depraved and that he was violent. Like I said, he'd been kicked out of school as a direct result of violence. So it is very frustrating to me to know that there were all these stories, all these obvious and ominous foreshadowings to the horrific things that he would ultimately go on to do to Darlene. But sadly, that night when he pulled up in his 1971 Plymouth satellite and offered her a ride, all she saw was a teenage boy just appear looking to lend a helping hand. So she accepted his offer and she hopped in the back seat just as the man who would go on to kill her less than an hour later pulled away from the bus stop. And also just in time for her boyfriend to peek out of his window only to discover that she was gone. Unfortunately though, he had missed the opportunity to catch a glimpse of David's car. So like I said, he had no reason to assume anything other than the fact that Darlene had caught the bus and that she was headed home. And I cannot even begin to imagine the soul crushing and like oppressive guilt that has plagued this poor boy ever since that night. Obviously now looking back, it's easy for us to criticize and to say that like, duh, he should not have left Darlene alone at that bus stop. He should have stayed with her and he should have waited for the bus to pick her up. You know, all the things that this poor guy I'm sure has thought about every single day since, but Darlene was insistent. She insisted he go home and she insisted she'd be fine. And that's not to mention that he had probably lived in that house for years. Just a hop, skip and a jump away from that very bus station. And I'm willing to bet nothing bad had ever happened before. From what I was able to find, he'd never had any issues walking that neighborhood and he'd certainly never had any issues waiting for a bus. And that is what is so, so scary about these wrong place, wrong time type of crimes. 99.9999% of the time, everything is totally and completely fine. But then eventually comes around that 0.0001% that everything is not fine. And devastatingly, Darlene climbing into the backseat of David's Plymouth, well, that was in that 0.0001%. Sidebar, I've seen a couple different reasons listed as to why she rode in the back seat that night. I've seen it posed as her personal choice that he pulled up, unlocked the doors, and that she chose to sit in the back. But I've also seen it suggested that David got out of the car and opened the back door for her, effectively making him the one to choose where she sat. Personally, I tend to land under the umbrella of the assumption that she herself chose to get in the back seat, because in my opinion, him pulling up, asking if she wanted a ride, her saying yes, him getting out, walking around the car, opening the door for her, and then walking back around to the driver's seat, getting back in and then driving off. Personally, I think that this would have taken a lot longer than it would have taken for her boyfriend to get into his house and into his bedroom to the window where he could see the bus stop. I think it makes more sense that he pulled up, asked her if she wanted a ride, she accepted, he unlocked the doors, and then she hopped in. And if I'm right, which, Obviously, we'll never know if I am or not, but if I am, it makes me feel like she wasn't really 100% comfortable with the idea of getting into this car 
at any point. Do you get what I'm saying? It seems like she was from the start putting as much distance between her and him as she possibly could. And I don't know about you, but to me, that is not giving I trust this guy. Again, this is all just speculation, but it seems to me like at the very least, she was slightly apprehensive, causing her to, from the get go, attempt to put sort of a barrier in between the two of them. But because she was desperate to get home as fast as she possibly could, regardless of how secure she felt in her decision or not, Darlene did accept David's offer. She did get into the car and within just a few seconds, they were off. Now, based on my Google mapping skills, I believe that it would have taken just a few minutes for David to get Darlene home had that ever truly been his intention. Six, maybe 10 minutes tops. So when Darlene noticed that not only did he pass a street that he should have taken in order to get her home, but that he also seemed to be deliberately running through every stop sign and every red light that they happened to encounter, well, that was when Darlene started to worry that perhaps she had made a mistake in getting in this man's car. She tried not to panic and she tried not to lose her cool. She simply asked David where he was going because at this point it just seemed like he was kind of driving around aimlessly. And he told her that he was sorry, he wasn't trying to freak her out and that all he was doing was driving around and looking for somewhere to turn back around. And for a second, I assume this eased her mind, but as he passed more and more areas where he could have easily done so, Dolly's fears started gradually creeping back in. Eventually to the point where she even actually told him that he didn't need to worry about taking her home anymore, that he could just let her out right where they were. But he ignored her request and instead he slowly pulled into the parking lot of a nearby factory, the 600 Group Equipment Factory. He pulled his car back behind the building, he parked it near a pile of scrap wood, and then before Darlene could even begin to wonder where they were or what was happening. David James Dobson lunged from the driver's seat into the back seat and he began his disgusting and vicious attack. An attack that grotesquely, I have almost a minute by minute breakdown of. Yeah, Dobson later writes out a very detailed confession letter and mails it to police, something I'll obviously get more into later. But my point in telling you that now is that I wanna give you one more heads up, one more exit ramp, if you will. The next little bit of this story is incredibly difficult to hear. It's difficult to process and it's difficult to sit with after. So if you don't wanna hear everything that happened to Darlene in detail, go ahead and skip to this timestamp here. But if you're sticking with me through this whole thing, I appreciate you, don't get me wrong, but you've been warned. So um, Dobson jumps into the back seat with Darlene, this, obviously terrifies her, so understandably, she started screaming immediately. I mean, clearly she'd been on edge for a majority of this ride, but it was now more clear than ever that this man's intentions, they weren't good. So she screamed and she screamed and she screamed and she tried to fight him off, but there was really nothing that she could do. She was trapped and Dobson knew that. He knew that she couldn't get away, so he simply just tried to get her to be quiet. He told her numerous times that she needed to shut up, and he told her that if she knew it was good for her, she'd be quiet. Oh, and then the real cherry on top of all of this is that he told her that she didn't have to worry because he was, quote, only after sex, as if that was supposed to bring her like some great deal of comfort. Obviously, I understand that he was trying to explain to her that as long as she did what he wanted, he would eventually let her go. But still, the fact that a man would think that rape would be a comfort to a woman in a situation like this one, get a fucking grip on your life, bro. So he's in the back seat with Darlene. From my understanding, he did eventually get her to stop screaming. And from there, he just begins like pawing at her, groping at her, shoving his hand in all the places that it didn't belong. Just, it, it makes my skin crawl to imagine what this poor girl had to go through. And this is just the beginning. From groping at her, he proceeded to like position her how he wanted her. And then from there, he instructed her to remove her pants. And I think we can all logically deduce what came next. This man is clearly an animal and he did in fact go on to rape her as such. And I don't need to clarify this, I'm sure, but 
Obviously, Darlene was so upset by this. She was so scared and so traumatized and she just really couldn't do anything other than cry and tell him that she didn't want to get pregnant. Not that what Darlene wanted was of any concern to David Dobson, but yeah. When he was finally done with this portion of the attack, he instructed Darlene to get out of the car and he made sure to tightly hold on to her by her jeans belt loop the entire time so that she had no chance to try and get away. Not that I'm sure she imagined she stood any sort of like physical chance against David anyway, because I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but David Dobson, he a big boy. He was over six foot tall, pushing 200 pounds, with just a full grown beard. Sure. He might have been 17 years old, but physically speaking, he was every bit a full grown ass man. And poor Darlene, I mean, she was tiny. She fought, she tried, she did everything she could, but ultimately he was just too big and too strong for her. Now, the whole reason that David had told Darlene that he wanted her to get out of the car in the first place was because he wanted her to move from the back seat to the front seat. But then as they actually got up towards the front of the car, rather than putting Darlene in the front seat like he'd said he was going to, David instead stopped and told Darlene that first he had a surprise for her. And as I'm sure you can likely guess, just based on what we've gone over so far, that surprise, it wasn't anything good, nope. He reached into his car, he pulled out a brick that apparently he just kept in there. His explanation was that he sometimes used it as a weight to help him start his car. Like, I guess he would put it on the accelerator to help the engine turn over and to get the car going or something along those lines. To be quite frank, I really don't understand the mechanics of that, nor do I understand if that would be a plausible explanation for having a brick in his car, but later on, that's what he claimed that it was there for. But here in this current moment, this brick was what he was planning to surprise Darlene with. He grabbed the brick out, he looked Darlene directly in her eyes, and he then proceeded to repeatedly bludgeon her with it. And, ugh, Poor Dolly, she screamed out in pain as Domson repeatedly hit her over and over and over again, just mercilessly pummeling her with this random ass brick. And that was just until he happened to look over and notice that right there in the parking lot behind the building, there happened to be a bigger brick. Because remember, this is all taking place behind an old factory. There's all kinds of miscellaneous junk just laying around. So when Dobson notices this bigger brick, he ditches the smaller brick, picks up the bigger one, and then proceeds to hit Darlene over the head with that one upwards of 10 additional times. And by this point, Darlene is crumpled onto the ground. She's in unimaginable pain and she's just doing anything and everything she can to try and defend herself. She tried blocking his blows. She tried begging him to stop and she tried simply begging for her life. And while well, obviously all of that is very upsetting to hear, perhaps the most eerie thing that Darlene said was when she explicitly asked Dobson not to strangle her. It was almost like hearing Darlene say this reminded him that choking or strangling her was even an available option. Almost immediately after she asked him not to strangle her, Dobson grabbed a piece of wood from the scrap pile they were parked near. He took it and he began firmly pressing it down into Darlene's neck, completely cutting off her air supply. And he did this a couple of times. He would cut off her air just until she was like right about to lose consciousness, only to then let up to ensure that she would stay awake for every single disgusting thing that he still had planned for her. Sometimes he would press the wood into her neck and lean into it with his body weight to cut off her air. But then sometimes he would position it just right so that he could stand on it in order to press it down to cut off her air supply. And aside from this being terrifying, can you imagine how painful that must have been? I mean, Jesus. And of course, he still wasn't done. Because once he'd had enough of this particular part of his torture, he discarded the wood, he grabbed Darlene by her ankles, and he dragged her across the concrete, away from his car, and into a like little grassy area that sat behind the factory. And as he had been dragging her, you know, across the asphalt, as I'm sure you can imagine, Darlene's clothing 
became disheveled. Her pants were still undone and loose from the assault in the car. So as he drug her by them, they began to come down. And conversely, as her back scraped across the concrete, her shirt and jacket began to come up, eventually bunching up around her shoulders. And unfortunately, this did ultimately expose her bare chest. And in seeing this, Dobson saw an opportunity to violate Darlene even more than he already had. As he noticed that her chest was exposed, he leaned down and as hard as he possibly could, he bit into her on her right breast. He then forcibly removed Darlene's pants as well as her undergarments. And with her own lighter, Dobson then decided to torch Darlene's hair, like her pubic hair. And just a friendly reminder, Darlene was still 100% alive and coherent through all of this. Pathologists on this case would actually later theorize that Darlene was likely alive, awake, and coherent right up until the very last second of this brutal, just horrifying attack. She was still alive as he bit her, as he lit parts of her on fire, as he pierced her skin with a safety pin. He also got the lighter hot and burned other random areas of her skin with the metal. I mean, this kid, teenager, man, whatever the fuck you wanna call him, this animal was just so unbelievably sick and twisted. He was very clearly just trying to do anything and everything that he could possibly think of to cause Darlene as much pain and as much suffering as humanly possible. From things he claimed to have seen in magazines to things that he came up with in his own sick little head. This fucking limp dick loser clearly had no limits as to what he was willing to do to this poor defenseless girl. Next he found and grabbed another piece of wood, this time a piece that had a large nail sticking out of it. And he used this to strategically puncture numerous different areas of Darlene's body, her chest, her neck, her head, he would take the nail, he would place it where he wanted it, and then he would use like the base of his palm, like right above his wrist. He would use that to hit the back side of the board in order to drive the nail into Darlene. And just to clear the air here quickly, I know this is a lot. I know it's graphic. I know it's difficult to hear. Trust me, I accidentally stumbled across some of the crime scene photos and believe you me, I will never forget the things I saw. But personally, I feel as though if this poor girl had to experience this horror and her family had to hear about all of this in explicit detail, I think the least we can do is acknowledge it. You know, listen to it, acknowledge it, and pay respect to it, to Darlene and to the fight she put up and to the stress and the terror that she did manage to survive. Truly, the fear and the indignity that she must have felt experiencing all of this, it is, it's just beyond comprehension, beyond mine at least. And what David Dobson continues to go on to do to Darlene and to her body once she's passed, it makes me sick to my stomach. And I'm not saying that as a figure of speech, I'm not using it as an expression. I am telling you that I actually genuinely felt sick when I was reading through all of this. Once Dobson was done repeatedly stabbing Darlene with the nail on the board, he pulled her jacket up over her face. He flipped a 70 pound cinder block over onto her head. And then as the life drained from this innocent 16 year old girl's body, this absolute freak took this as an opportunity to perform oral sex on her as she took her final breaths. like. Truly, if I could bleach my brain after researching and presenting this case to you, I absolutely would. And I doubt I'm far off in assuming that most of you would love to be able to do the same by the time this video is over. Oh, and once he was done necrophilizing her body, he pocketed her lighter as well as the necklace she was wearing, her favorite necklace. He then urinated on her body as just one last final fuck you, to the human life he just brutalized and extinguished. And then he left. He got in his car, drove himself home, and he went straight to bed. Laid his demented little head on his fluffy little pillow and drifted peacefully off to sleep without a single care in the whole world. Meanwhile, though, back at the Prioriello house, as soon as Darlene had missed her curfew, her mother Helen got a sinking, visceral gut feeling 
that something was very, very wrong. She later referred to this feeling as mother's intuition, but whatever the case may be, she said she could just feel it in her heart that Darlene was not okay. She immediately reached out to police and she tried to file a missing persons report, but if you'll remember, this is the 80s, so I'm sure you can guess what I'm going to say next. Police told Helen that they couldn't file an official report on Darlene for at least 24 hours. Now, they did note down Darlene's description and they made a note of the fact that Helen had called, but honestly, this wasn't good enough for her. She had absolutely no intention of sitting around and waiting 24 hours just for someone to then finally go out and look for Darlene. So she threw on her shoes and accompanied by her oldest daughter, Terry, the two went out in the middle of the night together, desperately hoping that somehow, some way, they would be able to track Dolly down. They went anywhere and everywhere they could possibly think to go, including places that Terry later described as places that two women should not go in the dark by themselves. They did not care. They were on a mission, but ultimately and devastatingly, they could not find Darlene anywhere. So eventually they were forced to return home with no more answers than they'd had when they'd set out. And basically this meant that they were either going to have to wait for Dolly to show back up, or wait for the 24 hour mark to pass so that they could finally file a formal missing persons report. And ugh, this must have just been torture for Darlene's family. Just to feel it deep in your gut that something with a loved one of yours is terribly wrong, but then to realize that you have no control over the situation and that you basically have nowhere to turn, that you are on someone else's timeline in a situation like this, it is just awful to think about or to imagine yourself in those shoes. And I just want to say that, you know, just as like a little side PSA, this whole arbitrary 24 hour waiting period, it's not a thing, at least not in America. There is not actually any real designated like legal time frame that someone has to be missing before you can report them as such. So if you do ever find yourself in said proverbial shoes, which in Jesus's name you won't and neither will I, but if you ever are, if you ever feel it deep in your gut that something is wrong with someone you love and someone tries to tell you to wait, don't back down. I know it's been a little bit, but we learned in my last video with Lilana that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if ever you need to advocate for a loved one in a situation similar to this, bitch, you squeak till you can't squeak no more. It infuriates me to imagine the situation that the Priorellos were in. No one should ever have to go through that, to feel helpless and to feel as though your concerns aren't being taken seriously. And what's even more horrific than that is that in the grand scheme of what they end up having to go through, this is all just the beginning. Things for this poor family are only going to continue to pile on and continue to intensify and to get just so so much worse. Regretfully though, before we get into that, we do have to pivot back to Disgustoid Dave. Because while the Priori Yellows are clawing their way through literal hell on earth, little Davy Dobson was waking up from his peaceful night's slumber. Not a care in the world, not a shred of guilt to be had. Shoot, if anything, he was feeling excited for what the day was to bring. He was excited to get up and to go into work to see what if any, sort of circus his crime had trudged up. He rolled out of bed around six, got himself ready for work, and reportedly he headed out of his house sometime between 7 a.m. and 7.30. And I mentioned earlier that David had been kicked out of school just like a little bit before all of this took place, but what I haven't mentioned yet was that since then he had taken a job as a shipping clerk at the Wilron Equipment Factory. This factory was located in the Highway 401 like Dixie Road area, and it butted it up directly to the back of the 600 Groups building, right where he had abandoned Darlene. Meaning that from a roll-up bay door on the back of the Wilron factory, crusty ass Dave could literally see clear across the small grass area that divided the two properties, right to where Darlene's body had been left. And I don't know if he's ever confirmed this like one way or another, but personally, there is nothing on earth that could ever convince me that he hadn't done that on purpose. You cannot tell me that he did not specifically curate this whole thing in a way that would make it so he could watch the chaos unfold in real time as Darlene was discovered and his crimes became like public knowledge. So imagine his surprise when he got to work, clocked in and 
glanced out the back of the building to find nothing. No police cars, no media vans, no horrified spectators, nothing. Zip, zilch, nada. The area behind the 600 Group's building appeared every bit as desolate now as it had the night before. And you better believe that this was not at all how David had been expecting the morning to go down. No, he'd been expecting flashing lights, reporters, crime scene tape, you know, the whole shebang. He wanted all eyes, focus, and attention on Darlene, and more specifically, on the horrible and disgusting things that he'd done to her. And considering the fact that he's certifiable, he had absolutely no intention of waiting around for any of these things to happen organically. He wanted Darlene found as soon as possible so that he could sit back, relax, and relish in not only what he'd done, but he was planning on soaking up every bit of the madness and pandemonium that was sure to ensue when Darlene was discovered. And so at a little after 10 a.m. that morning, when he simply could not take it any longer, David picked up the like communal phone at the Wilron factory and he placed a phone call to the 600 group. The phone rang as the call connected, and when the 600 group's receptionist answered the phone, Dave, who was now claiming that his name was Fred, told her that someone needed to call the police because there was a dead body behind their building. Then he just, click, hung right up. And the receptionist, whose real name I found once and was never able to find again, so for the purposes of the story, I'll be referring to her as Rose, since I've seen a bunch of other sources refer to her as such. But obviously, after hearing this, Rose, she was shook. I mean, that's not how anyone plans on starting their morning. So she was visibly upset after she hung up from this phone call. So much so that the guy whose desk was next to hers saw her face and how it had, like, completely drained of color. And he was like, girl, are you good? And because she was in fact not good, she started explaining to him all about Fred and all about what he had claimed was behind their building. And bless this guy's heart, he really did try to comfort her and to calm her down. He tried to reassure her that the call was probably just a prank, meant to elicit the exact reaction she was now displaying, and that there was just simply no way that there was a dead body behind the factory. But Rose, she just wasn't convinced. She couldn't really pinpoint what it was specifically about the call that had freaked her out so much, but she just did not believe in her heart that it was a prank. So after sitting on the information for a few minutes and not being able to shake the feeling that someone needed to check behind the building, Rose finally got up, she left her desk, and she made her way out to the area behind the building. And sure enough, just as the caller had warned her there would be, lying in the grass behind the 600 group building, Rose found the partially nude body of a young woman. But before I get into any more detail on that, I'm going to take my break and throw on my lashes, you know, give us all a chance to decompress a bit. And when we get back, David's circus truly begins. Don't go nowhere. All right, so we're back. And before our break, Rose had headed out back to call Fred's bluff, only to find out that he had not been bluffing. There was, in fact, a dead body abandoned behind the factory's building. It was clearly that of a young girl. Her shirt had been pushed up around her neck and shoulders, exposing her chest, and she was also nude from the waist down. Appearing to have been posed in a very suggestive and, uh, frankly, very disturbing way. Again, I accidentally stumbled across some of the crime scene photos, completely unexpected, and I definitely wish that I had not. So I can't even imagine how disturbing this was to stumble across in real life. It must have been so traumatizing. Actually, I know for a fact that it was traumatizing. From the obvious torture that this girl had been through to the suggestive nature in which she was left, exposed for anyone to see, right down to the 70 pound block that was crushing her face. There have been numerous people who have come forward in the years following this case 
just to discuss how deeply this whole experience truly affected them. Starting with the two officers that responded to the 600 Group's 911 call. These poor, unsuspecting patrol officers had responded to this call simply because that specific area had been their assigned beat for the day. They didn't even have a year of experience between the two of them combined. They were very, very new to the force. So I have to imagine that they were not even slightly prepared for what they were about to see. And this affected them so much that after responding to the 600 group's frantic 911 call and after seeing Darlene's body, one of the officers quit the force entirely and the other one, who did choose to stay on, he ended up requesting to be moved permanently to a desk position. And he remained there behind that desk for the rest of his career with the police force. He wanted to remain safely tucked behind that desk, never wanting to take the chance of having to witness something like that crime scene ever again. Shit, even the seasoned detectives that ended up taking on the case afterwards had their worlds absolutely rocked by the brutality of what happened to Darlene. There's a show on investigation discovery called The Case That Haunts Me. And in 2018, almost 40 years after this investigation had taken place and the crime had been solved, Detective Rod Pukala still ended up choosing Darlene's case as the one that had affected him the most throughout his career. And truly, even four decades later, you can tell just how upset and disturbed he still is by everything he experienced throughout this investigation. Honestly, this ordeal really seemed to rock pretty much all of Mississauga as a whole. From the time that Darlene was discovered to the time that David was finally arrested, people were terrified. Women and girls were terrified that they'd be next. Men were terrified for their wives and for their daughters. People stopped going out. They stopped using public transportation. And we're just talking to people who heard about what happened. So imagine the lasting and traumatic impact that this had on everyone that was actually directly involved. Like, wow. Like the poor receptionist from the 600 group, Rose. I mean, getting that call about the body, that would have been traumatic enough. Finding the body incomprehensible. But then to make matters exponentially worse, David just could not stop fucking calling. We know he called the first time just to tip them off about what he had done. Then he called a second time a few minutes later to ask why police weren't there yet. Then he called again a third time once police were on site and the investigation was getting started just to instill even more fear into Rose. The phone rang, she answered, and this third time, David, who remember is posing as a man named Fred, told her, quote, the future is uncertain, the end is always near, and you're going to die too. And as ominous and terrifying as these words were for Rose to hear, this was actually not something original that David had crafted for this scenario specifically. No, this was actually the third verse from a song called Roadhouse Blues by The Doors. Well, I woke up this morning and I got myself a beer. The future's uncertain and the end is always near. And then it goes into the chorus. So I guess if I'm gonna give credit where credit's due, David did ad lib the whole you're gonna die too part. But for the most part, this threat came from the Dwarf song. And I think we can all agree that like, he could have just stopped there. Well, I mean, he could have stopped before he even offered Darlene the ride the night before. I mean, that would have been ideal, but you get what I'm saying. He had done what he'd set out to. He'd gotten Darlene's body found. He'd sufficiently freaked everybody out. He'd spent damn near all morning on the phone harassing these people. Like, don't you have an actual job to be doing right now? Evidently not a very demanding one because unfortunately he still wasn't done. Luckily these calls did end up being to his own detriment, but that doesn't change the fact that God, it was so arrogant and annoying. But once police realized that apparently their mystery man was going to keep calling, they simultaneously realized that if they could get Rose to keep Fred on the phone long enough, they could very likely trace these calls right to the source and straight to Fred himself. And so they called all the right people and they set up all the right equipment. And just as they hoped he would, Fred, did call again. However, what they couldn't have anticipated though was that after this fourth phone call, nobody was gonna wanna stick around. Cause when Rose did answer this call, this is when David informed her that he had planted three sticks of dynamite 
throughout the 600 groups building and that they all had three minutes to evacuate before the explosives detonated, you know, effectively leveling the building and by extension, anyone remaining in it. Oh, and to add insult to injury, this call wasn't even long enough for police to trace. So now they either had to fully evacuate the building and chance missing any further potentially traceable calls, or they had to keep a select few people in the building in hopes of catching any further calls, but obviously in doing so, they would be risking those select few people's lives. And so as soon as Rose hung up the phone and relayed Fred's message, police did like a quick on the fly risk assessment before they ended up settling on the latter option. Meaning almost all of the officers, as well as the vast majority of the 600 groups staff did ultimately end up evacuating the building. The only two people who chose to remain in the building following David's bomb threat were Detective Pukala and Rose, which I know sounds crazy, but Detective Pukala had begged her to stay. He promised her that everything was going to be fine, that if Fred had truly intended on hurting anyone, he likely wouldn't have phoned in a tip warning people. And most importantly, he explained to her that they needed to stay to answer the phone so that they could try and trace the next call. They needed to find out who this unhinged maniac was before he actually did hurt someone else. And Rose agreed. She stayed as all of her other coworkers ran for their lives. And like clockwork, about 90 seconds later, the phone did in fact ring again. Of course, it was Fred on the other line. And this time he was audibly annoyed that there was anyone left in the building to answer the phone. This meant that at least someone had refused to heed his warning. So he issued yet another one. He warned them this time that they had about 90 seconds left before, you know, then he hung up. But that was fine because you know what? This time they had him. They had managed to keep him on this final call long enough to successfully complete the trace. And now knowing that eventually they'd be able to extract his location via this information, there was no more reason for them to stay in the building. Detective Pukala and Rose finally were able to haul ass out of the building with just seconds to spare before the supposed detonation time. However, as everyone waited around, counting down, terrified of what was to come, the detonation time came. They basically counted it down second by second, three, two, one, and nothing. As I'm sure you all could have guessed, David had been completely full of shit. There was no dynamite, no bomb, no explosion, just a bold faced lie that he'd constructed to, in my opinion, try to get everyone out of the building and to get as many eyes on Darlene as he possibly could, which is sick. I mean, he's sick anyway, but I just feel like he was desperate to terrorize and to traumatize as many people throughout this whole ordeal as he possibly could. Cause he's a loser. A loser who, unbeknownst to him, police technicians were working feverishly to track down with the trace information that they'd extracted from the final phone call to the 600 group. And while they were doing that, the detectives heading up Darlene's case continued on with arguably the most important task, which was to identify who this poor young woman actually was. They started by cross-referencing what little information they could actually discern from their Jane Doe with any and all comparable missing persons reports that had been recently filed. And although a formal report hadn't been taken for Darlene, if you'll cast your memory back, police did take down her description as well as Helen's information. And so they were actually able to fairly quickly, albeit tentatively, identify that the body was likely that of Darlene Prioriello. Of course, though, they would have to take that tentative identification and turn it into a definitive one. A horrible process that would require relaying the information on the body, as well as the theory that it was likely Darlene, to the Prioriello family. So Detective Pukala got in his cruiser. He made his way from the 600 group over to the Prioriello home. He knocked on the door and once inside, he spoke with Helen as well as with Terry. He informed them that a body matching Darlene's description had been found that morning and that while they couldn't be sure yet, they were almost certain that this was the body of Darlene. He informed them that a body matching Darlene's description had been found that morning and that while they couldn't be 100% sure yet, they were as certain as they could be that it 
was Darlene. Of course, Helen was horrified to hear about the discovery of the body as well as about the condition it had been found in. But more than anything, honestly, she just refused to believe that it could possibly be Darlene. Not only would it be impossible to wrap your head around the realization that you're never going to see your child again, but also the fact that their last moments alive were spent in such terror and such anguish. I don't know how you could ever truly digest that information. How could Darlene have been planning a trip to Jamaica one moment and then just brutally murdered the next? It it just didn't seem real. Surely this had to be some sort of wildly unfortunate misunderstanding, right? Helen demanded to be taken down to the morgue herself so she could determine whether or not this truly was her daughter, which... <sighs> what an incredibly brave and... Once that's done, you can't undo it. So by demanding to see this body, Helen was taking a huge risk in potentially cementing into her mind just a god-awful last image of her youngest daughter. And what's even more devastating, if you can even believe that, is that when Helen was shown what was left of Darlene, she couldn't even definitively identify her own daughter. Darlene had simply been through too much physical trauma, and no matter how hard she tried, Helen just could not say, one way or another, whether or not this was her daughter. She had subjected herself to seeing this body in this condition, whether it was Darlene or not, for nothing. And this left fingerprint comparison as the only real viable option left to positively identify this body. And obviously, as we know, when fingerprints from the body were compared to fingerprints that police lifted from Darlene's personal belongings, they were a perfect match. It was official. The mutilated body discovered behind the 600 Group's factory was in fact that of 16-year-old Dolly Prioriello. And while, yes, this was a crucial part of the investigation, it still wasn't anyone's desired outcome. It was still an incredible tragedy and an inconceivable loss for the community and a world-shattering, life-altering catastrophe for the Prioriellos. And while learning who their Jane Doe was did temporarily open up other investigatory, is that a word? It gave them other leads, basically, to follow in hopes of trying to find out what kind of sick, sadistic SOB could be responsible for taking an innocent young girl's life in such a brutal way. They briefly looked into Darlene's boyfriend, which, duh, I don't think that surprises anyone, but it really didn't take long for police to come to the conclusion that he was not their guy. And beyond that, they really couldn't come up with anyone else that seemed like a viable option. Darlene was such a happy, bubbly, fun-loving, just typical teenage girl. She didn't have enemies. No one was after her. Conversely, everyone seemed to really love her and seemed to be deeply saddened by her death. And this led police to, basically from day one, theorize that whoever had done this to Darlene was not someone who knew her personally. Nor did they think that there was any possible way nary a snowball's chance in hell, you might say, that this could be this mystery person's first crime. There was no freaking way. So naturally, that meant that their next step was to look into known criminals in the area. Specifically, given the brutality of what had happened to Darlene, police were understandably particularly interested in any and all known and documented sex of in the area. And this included, but certainly was not limited to, 31-year-old convicted rapist Ronald Brian Perkins, who at the time was actually one of the area's 10 most wanted men. Not only had he been convicted of numerous sex crimes in the area, but right before Darlene's death, he had somehow managed to escape police custody while being escorted to a psychiatric evaluation. So yeah, he was definitely temporarily on police's list, but as we know, he was not responsible in any way, shape, or form for this particular crime, for what had happened to Darlene. Don't get me wrong, he was in fact a disgusting piece of human garbage, and disturbingly, he actually managed to stay on the run in the United States for like 
seven years after he escaped. But once the information from the phone call trace came back, it became pretty obvious to police that Ronald Brian Perkins was definitely not their caller. He wasn't Fred. Therefore, this meant that he was also very likely not the killer. Now, they didn't completely rule him out immediately. There was still a very small chance that the caller and the killer could potentially maybe be two different people. But given the fact that the call trace didn't come back as having come from a payphone or a sketchy motel or I don't know, wherever else you might expect a high profile fugitive to call from. And that's because as we're all well aware, the trace on Fred's call came back to the old Wilron equipment factory just meters away from where Darlene had been discovered. And like I said, RBP was one of the most wanted men in the area at the time. And Wilron only had like 15, 25 employees working on the factory floor at any given time. So I guarantee someone would have noticed had he strolled in and just decided to tie up the communal employee phone line. So this meant that they needed to head on over to Wilron, scope things out, and try to figure out which employee had spent their morning on the phone. That said though, the last thing that police were trying to do was tip off whomever they were looking for, that they were closing in on him. They wanted to keep the upper hand, so to speak. So rather than storming the employee floor in the middle of the day, just guns blazing, police actually ended up waiting until later that night when all the employees had gone home for the day. That way they could then have free reign of the factory floor. They could snoop around the employee work areas. And of course they could speak freely with the factory's owner. Mind you, this is all happening still within the first 24 hours of the investigation. They made their first trip to Wilron after the factory had closed the day that Darlene had been discovered. So they were actually moving pretty quickly in the grand scheme of things. They've already narrowed down where Fred's calls were coming from, and this effectively narrowed their suspect pool down to just a couple dozen people. And now they're at the scene of the phone calls, perusing around said couple dozen people's workstations. All of course, with the permission of the factory owner. I think I saw somewhere that his name was Mr. Pels, but that also might be as fake as the 600 groups receptionist's name being Rose, so, don't quote me on that. But he's accompanying them around the factory floor. He's showing them around. He's answering their questions when all of a sudden, boom, something catches the detective's eyes. What was that something? I'm glad you asked. While walking around the factory floor, police noticed that scribbled on a whiteboard above one of the employee stations were some very interesting song lyrics. Any guesses? <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Verse three, line three of the Doors' 1970 hit, Roadhouse Blues. The future is uncertain and the end is always near. Word for word, the exact ominous message that Fred had delivered to Rose during his third phone call. And so they asked Mr. Pels, love that I have fully committed to that being his name when I'm only like 60% sure that it's right. But they asked him whose workstation they were looking at. Because at this point, it's almost certainly their guy. Not only does he have the song lyrics written on his whiteboard, but he also had a couple of post-it notes on his desk, one with the 600 Group's phone number scribbled on it, and one with the Mississauga News phone number scribbled on it. Sidebar, David had also called the news in the wake of Darlene's body being discovered. And so Pels tells them like, oh, this is one of my newer guy's stations. His name is David Dobson. And I'll tell you what, this one, really stuck out to police. We're talking a mega light bulb moment. And that's because this actually was not the first time that police had heard David Dobson's name that day. Up to that moment though, they had just known him as a creepo that had been hanging around the crime scene that afternoon. Yeah, I guess on his lunch break that day, David had decided to walk over to the 600 group and ask one of the officers if, quote, they knew who killed her yet. And police found this incredibly telling, I guess you could say. Cause at that point it had not been made public knowledge yet to most people that the body had been a female. So when he asked them that it really stuck out. So now that coupled with the phone call trace and the phone numbers and the song lyric on the whiteboard, this guy is clearly their guy. Well, he's at least the caller 
that much they're sure of. Cause like, there's no way this is all a coincidence, you know? But what was really frustrating though, was that all they could prove at this point was that David was their caller. Beyond that, they did not have the evidence in hand yet to prove that he was also their killer. Sure, it was wildly inappropriate and suspicious to be placing the Fred phone calls, but it's not illegal to place an inappropriate phone call. So although they felt as though they were really closing in on their guy, they still needed something more, some sort of real, physical, tangible evidence that could tie David Dobson beyond a reasonable doubt to the murder of Darlene Prioriello. And so on a mission to obtain said real physical tangible evidence, less than 24 hours after Darlene's body had been discovered, police ordered 24 hour surveillance on 17 year old David Dobson. Mind you, he was none the wiser to this, quite the opposite really. He was actually so ridiculously and boldly confident the police would not be able to identify him that over the next few days, he simply could not resist the urge to continuously and sloppily, might I add, insert himself into police's investigation as well as into the Prioriello's lives. Yeah, over the next few days, still on the work phone, BT dubs. David called up Darlene's school to find out when her funeral was. He called the cemetery to find out exactly where she was going to be buried. And to top it all off, this absolute shit sandwich called up Darlene's elderly grandma. And by telling her that he had been a friend of Darlene's, he actually managed to convince this poor old woman to give him Helen's unlisted home telephone number. And as I'm sure that you will not have any trouble believing, David did not intend to use this number for any kind of justifiable reason. Not that there would have ever been any justifiable reason for David to contact Darlene's family, but ugh. he called them and he taunted them about what he had done to Darlene. He made them relive the biggest nightmare of their lives over and over and over again. And that's actually something that he'll continue to do even well after he gets caught, but let me not get ahead of myself. Truly though, how sick in the fucking head does a person have to be? Like, it's not enough for him to know that just given the situation, the family was going through absolute hell, but he had to then get his rocks off by calling them directly just to hear the anguish in their voice, to experience firsthand just how broken and devastated his actions had rendered them, as if they were not going through enough to know that every time they thought it could possibly not get any worse, it somehow still seemed to. Oh, like when they found out that David was at Darlene's funeral. Yeah, let that one sink in. And obviously we know this because like I said, police had been tailing him since the evening that Darlene's body had been discovered. So while he thinks he's just playing a cat and mouse game, police were just biding their time, waiting as patiently as they possibly could for him to irreversibly slip up. And obviously it was super difficult for the Prioriellos to think that Darlene's killer could call them and harass them anytime he wanted. But honestly, police wanted him to keep talking. They wanted him to keep incriminating himself because they knew that eventually if he kept bumping at the gums, he would dig his own grave. And thankfully that is exactly what he ended up doing, idiot. So it was a few days after Darlene's body had been discovered. Therefore, it was also a few days after police had started their surveillance on David when they received yet another call from their old pal, Fred. This time he had taken it upon himself to reach out to police directly, even going so far as to specifically request to speak to the lead investigator on Darlene's case. And to reiterate, he has absolutely no idea that they know his true identity or that they've been watching his every move like hawks since mere hours after his first call to the 600 group. So thinking that he's covertly operating under this like cloak of anonymity, David, when speaking to police, felt perfectly comfortable in informing them that he had left them, you know, little care package in the overnight book return box at the Lakeview Library. And while obviously they knew that David had been at the library the night before, they did not yet know about the package or what exactly was inside of it. They had no idea that in that tiny, unassuming little brown box lay the exact tangible physical evidence that they'd been so desperately waiting for him to slip up with. Inside this package, David's dumbass had left Darlene's lighter, 
he had left her necklace and he had left the horrifying four page handwritten letter detailing for them every minute of the horrific torture he'd put Darlene through. That was the letter I told you about earlier. And you can absolutely find a copy of this letter online. It's a little worn and difficult to read, but it ain't that hard to read because I did have the misfortune of reading it. Most of it is just a much more graphic and detailed version of everything we've already talked about here today. How he'd come into contact with Darlene, how he got her into his car, the drive to the 600 group, just every awful detail of his blitz attack. It's all there, broken down damn near minute by minute in this freaky ass letter. Ew, and then to make it even more weird, in addition to just the confession, there were also these like weird nonsensical ramblings written all around the body of the letter, like out in the margins. Things like, she was pretty, she would of, yes, would of, which is a massive pet peeve of mine, but I digress. She was pretty, she would have made a good housewife, but she was a hitchhiker and now a statistic. Gross. Oh, and he also wrote in the margin of one of the pages that they should return Darlene's necklace to her mother and not try to keep it or sell it as if he's some sort of voice of reason or integrity all of a sudden. Like now you care about her family? Where, might I ask you, was that respect when you were butchering Darlene and then calling her family to laugh about it? Yeah, I'll link down below where you can read the full letter if... I don't know, you don't value your mental peace. Personally, I wouldn't read it if I didn't have to. It's definitely upsetting, especially because he writes almost as if Darlene was a willing participant through some parts of her attack. He even writes about certain parts as if she enjoyed it. And it really is just like violently upsetting. And it's pretty nauseating. It makes it very obvious, in my opinion, that he's very insecure in his masculinity. He writes in a way that seems like he wants people to think that although what he did was by force, Darlene enjoyed being with him. Which, uh, newsflash pal, uh, no. <sighs> and finally, he capped off this 500 plus word essay with a challenge for police. He told them that he planned to wait until the anniversary of Darlene's murder to strike again. He told them that he truly believed they would never figure out who he was because he had no criminal record, which considering they already knew exactly who he was before he even had the idea to write this dumbass letter, <laughs> how embarrassing. But he didn't know that. So he threw down the gauntlet and he told them to set up whatever bait they wanted to try and lure him out and to quote, catch him if they could. And what is mad ironic is that now with the letter and Darlene's belongings being able to link the caller to the murder and all the evidence they had to prove that David was the caller, now they had enough evidence to arrest David for Darlene's murder. And if you think that still wasn't enough, they were also able to eventually further prove that David was responsible for Darlene's death by matching a fingerprint from the inside of her thigh to David. I'm not going to get into all of that here because it's complex science and I'm dumb, but if you're interested in that process, it's called fingerprint fuming, I believe. And Darlene's case was actually the first time it was ever successfully used in Canada, which is pretty cool. But for now, 17 year old David James Dobson was arrested on May 12th, 1982, just after 7 a.m., less than 24 hours after he had challenged police to catch him again super embarrassing for him. He was arrested at the home that he shared with his parents while he leisurely ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And of course, when he was informed that he was being arrested, David showed absolutely no emotion, likely because he's a sociopath, in my opinion. But he didn't show fear, concern, remorse, sadness, glee. He simply asked police if he could have another glass of milk before they loaded him into the car. The sheer audacity of this man. Plus, I'm sorry, but straight up drinking cow's milk once you're older than like, I don't know, five, straight to jail. I'm kidding, to each their own, obviously. I just personally don't like milk. I think it's icky. But if you were wondering, no, police did not let him chug any more milk, nor did they let him finish his sandwich. <laughs> Actually, they ended up taking his sandwich in with them as evidence. They used it to compare David's bite pattern to the bite pattern that was left on Darlene. And I know that whole process is considered junk science now, but back then, 
people thought that shit was cutting edge. David did ultimately end up verbally confessing to police as well, all of the horrendous things that he'd done to Darlene. I mean, it was kind of hard for him to not own up to things when they found a brick still caked in her blood and hair in his car, but that's none of my business. I will say though that for someone cocky enough to literally challenge police to catch him, David is not a good criminal, not even a little bit. And although he had confessed to killing Darlene, he did still refuse to plead guilty to first degree murder, insisting that his attack on her had not been premeditated. Yeah, no, he was steadfast that if he was guilty of anything, it was second degree murder because killing Darlene to him had been a crime of passion. And I don't know what kind of two-bit half-baked, uh, piss-poor attempt this was at trying to cop a plea, but he clearly did not understand what a crime of passion was. A crime of passion has to be committed in response to provocation. Darlene didn't do anything to David, especially not anything that could have possibly reasonably provoked him into torturing her and killing her the way that he did. And thankfully the prosecution saw things similarly and his second degree murder plea was rejected. Therefore, David Dobson would stand trial for the premeditated murder of Darlene Prioriello as he damn well should have. His trial began just shy of a year after Darlene's murder and y'all, it was, a lot. Not only had the family issued many, many threats against David, none of which I fault them for, but on two separate occasions, Darlene's father and her uncle, each in court, made attempts to accost David. And again, I do not fault them for this. This man destroyed these people. He ripped apart life as they knew it for them. And now because he refused to take responsibility for his actions, they had to sit through a trial and listen yet again to the abhorrent, disgusting, graphic details of exactly what he had done to Darlene. All while sitting there and staring at his big, dumb, stupid, guilty face. Thankfully though, despite his attempts to skirt responsibility in Darlene's death, on April 11th, 1983, David Dobson was convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Because remember, Canada. And considering that the Prioriellos had wanted Canada to reinstate the death penalty in response to Darlene's case, it should go without saying that they were underwhelmed by this outcome. They didn't want him in prison for life as much as they wanted him under the prison, if you will. And I can't say that I blame them. In my opinion, anyone who wakes up one day and out of the blue brutalizes and murders an innocent child like this, you gotta go. In my opinion, you are beyond rehabilitation. You can't convince me that the things that he did to Darlene were not truly fueled by evil. And if he hadn't been so stupid and gotten himself caught so quickly, there is not even a single fragment of a doubt in my mind that he would have gone on to do this again. God only knows how many innocent and unsuspecting young women were saved by getting him behind bars. Shoot, he even said himself that he was planning on striking again the following year. So thank God that instead of that, he was getting handed a big old sloppy wet life sentence. Throughout the years following David's conviction and sentencing, the Prioriellos have remained heavily involved in keeping him behind bars and as isolated from the public as humanly possible. For starters, in 2004, when David was transferred from the medium security prison that he'd spent the first 21 years of his sentence in to a fenceless minimum security prison where he was intended to ride out the remainder. And this wasn't anything special that the prison did like for David specifically. It was just a routine part of the rehabilitation process that would ideally lead to release. And I say ideally, because in a lot of cases I am pro rehabilitation, but in cases like this, and Darlene's family was also not having this. When they found out about it, they actually reached out to the Canadian Resource Center for Victims of Crime. And through a collaborative effort, they and the Prioriellos ended up successfully persuading officials to return David to the original medium security prison. And while this was a relief, it was short-lived because just three years later, David Dobson was officially eligible to start applying for parole. And if he didn't get out on his first try from that point on, 2007 to infinity, he would continue to come up for parole consideration every two 
years. So bet your bottom dollar that when 2007 rolled around and his hearing came up, the Priorellos were there in droves, ready to give their statements and to implore the parole board to reject David's application. Terry even brought a petition with her that she'd had signed by over 6,000 people. Ugh, and she also wore one of Darlene's old jackets to the hearing so that she could feel like she was close to her sister while she was forced to look into the eyes of the man that took her away. And that part just really got me because as I'm pretty sure I've mentioned before, my sister and I are insanely codependent. We're even married to brothers. So we're sisters and sisters-in-law. Like we couldn't be closer if we tried. So thinking of losing her and then having to face the responsible person every two years, absolutely not. Terry even told the Toronto Star that looking at David to her was like looking at the devil himself. Like I said, this man had wrecked their family. According to Terry, Darlene's death completely changed their father. From that point on, it was almost like he was incapable of caring for his remaining children. Like he was scared to allow himself to be attached to them. And as far as Helen, evidently she went from always being able to make everyone feel as if everything was going to be okay to she herself never believing that anything could be okay ever again. And that was because, whew, and y'all buckle up for this one. Helen used to tell Darlene that there were no such thing as monsters. But now, because of what David did, she knows that she was wrong. Yeah, dude, heartbreaking. Thankfully, it only took 30 minutes for the parole board to decide that David Dobson was not a suitable candidate for release at least not right then. So he would have to serve at least another two years before he would be eligible for reconsideration. But this just did not feel long enough for Darlene's family. I mean, two years is nothing. It would have felt like the blink of an eye. It would have felt like they walked out of that courtroom just to turn around and walk back in to once again, face Darlene's killer and once again, beg for them to keep him behind bars. Like, haven't they been through enough? I'm sorry more than enough, they should not have to keep having their wounds gouged back open every two years when this wasteoid decides to roll the dice at a chance for freedom. Because it's not like there was really much in it for them to go to these hearings and have to see him over and over again. Sure, they could go and read an impact statement and they could see firsthand him get carted back off to prison, but one, they'd rather not see him at all. And two, even when it came to their statements, it wasn't like they got free reign to say how they truly felt. Instead, they apparently had to submit their impact statements prior to these parole hearings for approval. And there were actually numerous times that apparently they were asked to edit down their statements or to remove certain things in an effort to remain fair to David. Yeah, ridiculous. And that was when he actually showed up for these hearings. Cause sometimes he'd request a hearing, the Priorellos would get all worked up and stressed out. They'd be bugging at the thought of him possibly being released only for David to then poof, retract his hearing request. Like this shit was so stressful for Darlene's family that Helen ended up in the hospital multiple times just because of what all this stress was doing to her body. Be so fucking for real right now that the last thing that David Dobson did to Darlene was pee on her body, but her family has to show him respect? Hell no. I cannot even begin to imagine how angry they all must have been. It was seemingly just one injustice right after the other, but because they are fighters rather than just sitting around and stewing in their own rage, which by the way, they would have been totally within their right to do. But instead the Priorellos took their anger and they channeled it into fighting for legislative changes in Canada. Changes that would require at least a five year time period between parole eligibility hearings rather than a two year period. And their argument was simple. Having to prepare for these hearings every two years hindered them from living their lives. It kept them in a constant state of anxiety and they were always on edge. It was like they went from one hearing straight into dreading the next one. They felt like they couldn't relax and they couldn't try to return to normal life because it was always looming over them that before they knew it, they'd be right back there again, facing Dobson. We don't think convicted killers or repeat offenders should ever get out. If you get life in prison, it should mean life in prison. But since we know that's not going to happen, we're asking the federal government to increase the time to five years instead of two. Families have already been victimized once, 
They shouldn't have to be victimized every two years. Having to face our loved one's killer and to read what he did to her and how her death has affected our lives is something nobody should ever have to do once, never mind twice. That was a statement that Terry made at a 2014 Public Safety and National Security Committee meeting regarding Bill C-479. And basically, this bill would serve as an amendment to the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, effectively extending the period between prisoners' parole eligibility hearings from two years to five. And with significant help from the Priori Yellows, this bill did ultimately pass and it became a law in May of 2014. David did eventually make a statement after his first few parole denials that he was never planning on applying for parole ever again. And he claimed that this was out of his deep respect for Darlene's family. And while I am glad that hopefully the Prioriellos will never have to subject themselves to seeing this ass hat ever again, I personally don't buy for a second that he's doing this for their benefit. Whether he's truly found God in prison like he claims to or not, because don't they all? Nothing will ever convince me that he wants to stay in prison for any reason other than to benefit himself. I think he knows that he has spent almost all his life in prison and that he would have an impossible time trying to adjust to life as a free man. My guess is that he just doesn't think it's worth it to even try. Shit, he said himself in an interview in like 98, I think it was, the prison was comfortable and that serving time was easy. He spent his entire sentence in protective custody, given that people like David usually aren't well received in prison and he himself has bragged to people about his setup he's bragged about his tv and his personal cell that he can lock from the inside if he so chooses so yeah i think he's perfectly fine with where he's at and i think that he's skipping the parole hearings as to benefit he himself and him as of today, as far as I know, David is still in prison. Canada is a lot more secretive about their inmate information than the US, so I can't verify that for sure. But I think that if he'd been released, the Priorials would have had some shit to say about it publicly. So yeah. I don't know when his next parole eligibility date is, and chances are even when it rolls around, he won't file the request. But if he does, you can bet your ass that the Prioriellos will be right there protesting his release and continuing to advocate for justice for Darlene. But that's if David even lives to see his next parole hearing. Because while he may only be in his late 50s, supposedly, according to leaked prison documents, he does not appear to be doing well in prison. Supposedly, he's like, wasting away and he's constantly being shuttled back and forth to different medical treatments. I've seen it rumored he has cancer. I've seen it rumored he has AIDS. I couldn't tell you which is true. Couldn't tell you if either is true. And quite frankly, I can't tell you with any shred of honesty that I care either way. I think the day that that man dies, the world will become a significantly better place. But for now, 42 years later, he continues to remain incarcerated, making him Canada's longest serving inmate for a single murder. What an honor. And with that, you guys, we are about wrapped for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. Do you think David Dobson should be paroled or do you actually have a functioning brain? Sorry, I just cannot imagine anyone in their right mind being like, yeah, got him loose. Oh, damn, man. Rest in peace to poor Darlene. Her life was cut so, so short, and her last moments here on Earth were filled with so much fear and so much indignity. It is just not fair for anyone to go out like that. So truly, my thoughts are with her family because it doesn't matter if it's been, what did I just say, 42 years? yeah, almost, it'll be 42 in May. What happened to Darlene is never going to leave me. So I can't even imagine what it's been like living with that and knowing that it happened to their sister or their daughter. That can't possibly ever get easier to carry around. And I know it's been a really rough one, but I do genuinely want to thank Inlay again for requesting this one. I know I said this once already, but it is such an incredibly important story. And if Darlene had to endure all this pain that David Dobson inflicted on her, then the least least we can do is acknowledge it. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time today to watch this video and to listen to Darlene's story. If you have a case or a topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form that I have linked down in the description. And if you're a beauty girly like me and you're interested, then the links and the details for the makeup I use today will also be listed down there. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new videos almost every week. So if you turn on your post notifications, you'll always be notified when I do post and you'll always be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys.